Hello, it's Jessica Okoro. Welcome to the Stepping Into STEM podcast. We are still on a mission to expose a million of you to the STEM industry by 2023. Today, we have a very special guest, Isaac Alawade. Isaac was born and raised in West London and studied an MEng aeronautical engineering degree at the University of Brighton. From a young age, Isaac's hobbies were centered around sports, health and fitness, especially football, which you're going to hear in a bit. Isaac is currently working for Collins Aerospace, where he's approaching the end of his three year leadership graduate scheme. Thanks for joining us, Isaac. Okay, so Isaac, we're going to go straight into the icebreaker. Okay, I'm going to ask you two questions and they're going to be really random. Nothing to do with STEM, nothing to do with what you do now. And I just want you to answer them based on your personality. Okay? Yeah, understood. Okay, so the first question is, if you were famous, what would you be famous for? I think this one is quite easy. It has to be football. Football is a sport that I've always played since when I was younger. It's probably quite an easy one that everyone else would probably say as well but for myself definitely football's been a passion for me since when I was young so I think that that is probably what I'd be famous for so be up there playing um, in the Champions League final World Cup that would be it so yeah so what would be the number on your shirt it's a great question so I think the number on my shirt would be number two because I generally played full back so if you know football right or left back so as a right back it would be number two okay so you have Striker, you have defenders. Yeah, sometimes they get mixed up. Yeah, yep. And you have midfielders. So, was you a midfielder or a defender or a goalkeeper? I was generally a defender, but when you play fullback or wing back, as it were, you can go up and down. So that's generally why why I would play there. So I could be contributing in attack and defence. So yeah. Oh, okay. My next question is: If a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be, and who would play you? <laughs> oh, this is an amazing question. So I think it would be a, a, like an action comedy sort of movie. And I think it'd be someone like um, Will Smith. Because the reason I say that is because once, uh, maybe about say four or five years ago is when I started um, wearing a high top. So I started to cut my hair into a high top. And since then, loads of people have called me Will Smith. I look like Will Smith and all sorts, even though I don't look nothing like Will Smith. In my <laughs> but given people say that, I'll say there'll be a bit of action in there, humour. Be quite, um, it'll be quite lighthearted, and I think people would enjoy it. So yeah, that's what that's what I'll do. That's what okay, I'll do. so you, you're kind of like Will from um, Fresh Prince. Is that what you're, yeah. you're kind of saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's right. Fresh Prince. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. So um, the next segment is Back to the Future, and I want you to tell me a bit about yourself. Um, what it was like growing up in West London and going to a school in West London. Sure. So my name's Isaac Alawode, as of course you might have known by now. So I grew up in West London around Ealing, Acton area, and it was quite fairly chilled. It was really multicultural. There was a lot going on over there. And I went to a school called Twyford Church of England High School, which is quite uh, one of probably one of the best schools to go to in an area that wasn't. Oi, oi, Savaloy. Take it easy. Take it easy. (laughs) Man like Isaac, one of the best schools. Did you have to take exams to get in then? No, that no, you didn't have to take an exam to get into that one. That fortunately it was one of those that there was a lot of people that would generally be wanting to go there. So the waiting list was always quite insane. But fortunately I was able to get into there. It wasn't too far from where I lived, maybe about a ten minute walk, something like that. Mm. So it was a great place where you were able to thrive and really reach your potential because the teachers would generally push you and it was quite disciplined in the sense that um, they would really be on your back for different bits of work and stuff. So it was, it was a really good school to be at. And there's a lot of people that are doing amazing things having gone to that school. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. And it's always great having teachers that are invested in wanting you to win. It, it just helps. It feels like you have a strong team behind you and you're not alone. Um, so where, where did your interest in maths, physics, chemistry and geography stem from? So for myself, I'd always been interested in, say, how the world works and actually in space travel. So a lot of the stuff with maths and physics stems on across, say, 
um, traveling through space and actually air travel, which leads on, of course, to what my degree was. But in terms of as well, science as a whole, so that encompassed why I really like chemistry. And then for geography, it was a case of I'm really very much interested in things like earthquakes and volcanoes. So I very much, again, like to see how the world works and what is the cause and effects of different things. So that as a whole encompassed why I decided to do those sort of subjects. Mm, makes sense. And was there pressure from your family to go to university after? So for myself, I wouldn't necessarily call it a major pressure. I would say I was advised. It was a case of I had to say establish what it was that I wanted to do and see whether university would be the best option for me. And my parents were very much supportive. And I think probably say go from an African household and they would generally want me to go to university. But I wouldn't say I was under a massive amount of pressure. It was allowing me to explore what I want to do, but justifying why it's the case. And did you ever consider like an apprenticeship route? Yes. In fact, whilst I was at college, I did actually apply for one, which I had an interview for, which I didn't get. And that apprenticeship was quite unique in the sense of you, once you were um, actively working and um, being paid for the work you're doing, they were managing and helping you towards a degree as well. So it really worked well in terms of the work and education balance. So I really actually applied for that one and I didn't get it. But given the area where I was, there weren't actually that many um, active apprenticeships, say within the engineering and area that say I could apply for for that. So that's probably where I did go with that. Yeah, that must have been really heartbreaking not getting accepted. How did you manage the you know the disappointment and not getting in? For myself, it was quite difficult at that time. It was a case of looking at it and seeing that that wasn't the right option for me. There were a lot of say obstacles and things in terms of people with a lot more experience than myself. And on top of that, I saw it as a case of being redirected, not rejected. And I think that's a great philosophy to take into any rejection that you may face in the future, that there's always gonna be another door that opens. And it's great for myself to experience different types of interviews, even if I don't get accepted to them, because there will be one where you do get accepted and you'll take those experiences from previous ones. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with that. I, I mean, experience, what experience would you have at that age anyway? I, I really, struggle to understand the kind of experience they expect you to have at such a young age. So, I mean, what experience do you think the other candidates had that you didn't have at that young age? Um, at that young age, so a lot of them actually had either, say, done degrees and other bits. They'd already been in industry for a number of years, but at the time I was only about 16, 17. So I had only just left school. I had a bit of work experience, say a week or so in different places. So I hadn't really experienced how um, different parts of the, say, business and engineering community work. So I didn't have so much to draw on on that aspect. So that's where I really fell, fell down in terms of experience. Yeah, I mean, when I was at school, I went on a two week work experience when I was in secondary school. Did they still do that, you know, when you were at secondary school? And did you what did yeah. you do? Yes, they still do it. So when I had mine, I had it in two places. So I worked in like a local shop. Um, must have been a supermarket or something just to get some experience. And then the other one was actually at the time a, a hospital. So wow. I just got a bit of experience just in and around the different, a few departments and understanding what they did there. At the time, I wouldn't say that I was very much interested in going into, say, medicine, but it was just an exploration point at that point. So it was great to experience it. Oh, okay. I love that. I love that you explored different areas of industry, of different industries, not just you know, aerospace. What age did you say, okay, I actually want to go into the aerospace engineering side of things? So for myself, it was when I was around, say, 16, 17 years old. So at that point, I had considered actually becoming a pilot. So I'm very much interested in, in travel, as I said, in flying. But for many that know about flying and things like that, and becoming a pilot is very much, uh, it's quite expensive, to say the least. So it was around that point where I considered, okay, Pilot, being a pilot was probably not the best thing. I could then go and do aerospace. So that's when I then decided to do aerospace, aeronautical. They're interchangeable words. Either of those, that's what I decided to do, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I keep on saying I love that because I think your story is so interesting. The fact that you did two weeks work experience in a hospital and in a local sh supermarket, you applied for apprenticeships, you got you know rejected, which sounds a bit harsh. Um, but then you were still very optimistic and you went ahead and 
you know, went to university, which takes us to the next segment, which is the game changer segment. And I really love this segment because it talks about that transition of, you know, getting into the educational side of things and, you know, the, the, the scheme or the, the, the opportunity that you're on. So to start off with, um, tell me about your transition from West London to Brighton. So my transition from West London to Brighton was a fairly smooth one, actually, in the sense of I was quite say, independent as a person. So I didn't wasn't going to be phased by the prospect of, say, going to have to move to another area. And now in Brighton in particular, it's often seen as London by the sea. So a lot of people from London there, so you could relate to a lot of them. Some people, of course, moved from various other locations. So it was great to be able to have some people that you could relate to. So I think that made it probably easier as well. So it was fairly smooth and I'm quite happy that it was that case. So Isaac, tell me a bit about the degree you studied and where you got the information from to actually get on this course. So I studied an MN or Master of Engineering in Aeronautical Engineering. And so in terms of looking at the information and applying for it, I've had to spend a lot of time researching different courses for various universities and things and seeing what it was that the course entailed, the various bits that you would understand from there. And then also speaking to some of my lecturers, some that not necessarily were in engineering, but were in science in one form or another. So hearing from them and understanding, okay, what would be more beneficial in doing one thing or another, or what I could gain from doing this, really helps me to look at all the different options and explore what it is I wanted to do. I love that. And were there any key, you know, criterias that you had or did you have a criteria to decide which course was suitable for you or not? Uh, for myself, so I wouldn't say I had a massive amount of criteria. It was a case of the, the learning would be matched up with, say, the practical. That was probably a big one. The practical element and the theory element will be fairly balanced because, of course, you can get areas where you can just be completely theory based and you may not feel that you get the most benefit out of it. But if it's a theory and practical together, then it gets matched up quite a lot and you can generally learn better. Of course, people have different ways of learning, but for myself, I think that is what helped. Yeah, that makes sense. And with regards to like applying for this degree, did you have help? Did you have support from anybody? Was there like a careers advisor at your college that could help you and support you with that? Yes, yeah, so we had the careers advisor that really helps in terms of, say, UCAS applications and things like that. And as well, a couple of our lecturers, especially the ones that I had for my science subjects, they were very much um, determined to help us. So going through your personal statement, oh, this, it takes me way back thinking about that now, but going through your personal statement, really helping to delve in and pinpoint the different bits that you can put in to really sell yourself in the right way. So yes, I had great help. That's, that's amazing. So I'm going to I'm going to go into a bit more of the the actual graduate program that you won at Collins. Um, could you tell us a bit about it? Just, you know, a little summary. Yeah, sure. So it is a three year graduate program in which you rotate around various areas of the business. So there's various different departments you're allowed to go into. And it's quite unique in the sense that everyone can almost forge their own pathway. You can carve your own pathway with help from a lot of your graduate managers and mentors within the business. So our first rotation was in cost reduction. So working within reducing costs for the business. Following on from that, it's been in um, working in continuous improvement. So really looking at processes and seeing how as a business we can improve in those and actually presenting information in the correct way. And then after that is more the operational side. So we have the direct labour who actually build the parts. We also have the indirect labour who help manage the support of building of those parts. So that's another area where I've been in. And due to COVID, I was actually due to only spend, say, six months working in that area, but ended up spending another six months due to the pandemic that happened from this time last year. And then more recently, it's been a case of working with our global um, suppliers. So other areas of the business that actually supply into our site. So with this area, we were actually given an opportunity to undertake a secondment. But again, due to COVID, various things happened and it meant that you're allowed to actually work with other sites and things. But it had to be, of course, based in the UK rather than based elsewhere. And so it's, it's really great, as I say, that you can do pretty much what you want just within reason. So it's, it's amazing. 
that's that sounds really exciting. I like the idea of moving around and having loads of different areas you can explore. Even within you know the pandemic, loads of us have been at home, stuck at home. So the fact that they found a way of you still being able to engage is really exciting. Tell me a bit about Collins as a company. I mean, what who are Collins? What do they do? Um, are there any key things that we may be aware of but not know that we're aware of that they've done? <laughs> Yeah. So yes, Collins is a quite a vast organisation. So it's part of Raytheon Technologies. Again, it's a it's a global business that delves into many different areas. So the business unit that I'm particularly part of is actuation. So for thrust reversers, for nacelles on um, aircraft, and also actuators. So things that prime the different areas of the wing. So that is a quite basic overview of it. We have so much that we do within the company. Supply to Airbus, Boeing, um, various other companies as well, Augusta Westland, there's various other companies that we supply to as well. And it's just a really great all global organization that delves into various different spheres. So, and now that there's a merger, must have been about two years ago between um, Collins, Aer well, Collins Aerospace, Rayfin, UTC, and um, Rayfin Technologies to become Collins Aerospace. So it's it's amazing, really. No, I do know Boeing, um, and I know Airbus, and I I know those those brands, those um, airspace brands. So I can imagine you, you know, supplying to these brands that you've probably grown to really love while studying your course, and grown to know and, and be inspired to kind of work with. It's quite fulfilling. Would I, would you would you yeah. say it's a fulfilling role? Yeah, definitely it's fulfilling. As a case, as I say, I've been very interested in space travel, air travel from a young age. So to be able to work in the industry and to contribute to actually the development of aircraft in one way or another and supporting that, it's, uh, it's great, it's, it's rewarding. Yeah, and do you ever, you know, look into things like SpaceX and think to yourself, I could one day be doing things like this and, and you know, challenging the status norm and, 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 you know, creating my own Airbuses and flying out? I do look at those things. I wouldn't say probably look at and see if I can challenge it but it's a case of actually being very much interested and again the way you actually challenging is interesting I, I would one day hope I could do something like that with help from people that are probably more intelligent than myself so yes I'd like to manage it that'd be great okay so tell me a bit about the leadership graduate program um it sounds quite intense it sounds like you're getting thrown in to become a leader in, in an organization is it along the lines of that Yes, that is. So they generally are looking at preparing the next leaders for the business in terms of the graduate scheme. So they're giving you various bits of experiences in different areas so that you can progress as a whole to becoming a business leader. So they're looking at developing that young talent, but it's almost a, it can see, be seen as a fast track, but at the same time, they take you as an individual. So they meet your needs once you look at all the different mentors and things and get the help that you need in terms of the career development, you can really look to progress in the company. So there's many in the organization who were graduates previously, who are now doing awesome things. Even our vice president was also a graduate. So it's amazing. Wow, that's really inspiring. And what's the advantages of the leadership graduate program at Collins? So I say the main advantages is the fact that the opportunities are almost endless. Once you show an interest and really apply yourself and have great work ethic, you can really go into any sphere you have, you want to. Any skill set you have can be used in one way or another in the right way. It just has to be cultivated within yourself. Once you really show yourself to be wanting to learn and actually working hard, you can achieve almost go into what you want. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Taking ownership of your future and the possible opportunities that could be presented to you is, is really important because I think people tend to forget that that power is actually in you. You know, if you put your best foot forward and you're constantly showing that you're using your own initiative and you're pushing to be the best you can be for the organization and for everyone around you, more opportunities will come your way. So the next segment is the good, the bad and the ugly truths. Are you ready? Yeah, ready for this. Let's go. Ready, you ready? Okay, so my first question, what challenges have you faced whilst working at Collins? Yes, so there's been a number of challenges that I've faced whilst working at the organisation. I'd say the main one is information. So once you start off in a department, you're very much new and it's almost like a, a complete new starter because of how vast the organisation is. 
you're almost really having to get go from the beginning. So you really are, let's say, treading water at the beginning. But when you seek the information that you need, then you are able to progress, as I've mentioned before, in terms of the help. So I, I would say that is the main one, information right at the beginning, getting as much of that as possible. Were there any, you know, strategies that you used to get the information in? Because, you know, like, did you use flashcards? Did you write notes on your phone? Did you, do you have any techniques you could share? I'd say the best one is just continually asking questions. So don't be afraid. And I think that's a, a big one. You're wanting to thinking that they may say a question you ask is stupid, but there is no stupid question. And once they see that you're enthusiastic to learn, they're very much looking to help. And then taking notes as well. Once you're told something or you're given some important information, just writing it down and just seeing so you can come back to it again and again if required. So yes, those are the advice I'd give. And how did you find working with people that were not necessarily within your age group or within your level of experience? Did you find it intimidating sometimes? At times, yes, I had. But because during the university, I'd had a placement year where I'd worked in industry for a year. It meant that once I'd started working at Collins, it was actually, it was a new experience, yes, but I had experienced similar things before. So really just acknowledging that they have more experience and stuff than you, but also making that your advantage in terms of asking them the question, being willing to learn from them, is always a valuable thing to do. Yeah, I can imagine. Also, I feel like you working at a local you know, shopping centre or local store would have helped you to learn to communicate to with different kinds of people, learn to work with different, you know, people with different temperaments, different characteristics, different personality types. Do you think that's helped you with, you know, your job today? Yes, I really do, especially communication skills and things like that. Another job which I didn't mention I did was my first one was actually working in a call centre as a charity fundraiser. And so, again, speaking to different people of different backgrounds, cultures and things like that has really helped to understand that everyone's unique and it's just taking them as they are and learning from them. So, yeah. yeah. No, I remember my first job was a paper round job. And, you know, when I was younger, I really did not like it. And I, I felt like what I was getting paid was not enough, you know, with the <laughs> early mornings, riding my bike. And then they would deduct um, money out of my wages if I got an address wrong. So I think things like that has really helped me become more disciplined at an older age and it's helped with my current career. So where do you where do you see yourself in five years, Isaac? So myself, there's two different routes that I'm sort of considering at the minute. So it's mainly an operations management route or programs route. So in the next five years, I'll see myself, say, as an operations manager or really developing as a senior program manager. So those are sort of spheres that I've been looking at and still working with my mentors to establish the right path for myself. So, yeah. So you used the key word there, you used mentors. Could you give me yeah. some insight into that and how you sourced them or if they were just, you know, given to you when you joined the company? So with my grad manager, he really helped me to connect with a number of people who explored different options and saw who's the people that can actually help me to progress. How did I, did I have much interest with them? Did they have similar interests to me, the values and things to be able to help? As well, just connecting with one or two mentors meant I could get in touch with some other people and have various different conversations. So even till now, I'm still having various conversations with a number of people who've had amazing experiences and is so valuable to be able to learn from people from all different areas and backgrounds. So, yeah. And Isaac, if you could have a conversation with your younger self, you know, you know, sit down on the bleachers before a football game with your younger self in secondary school, what would you say? I would say to myself that don't fear any challenge you're going to have. So I am the one to want to take on the challenge, but there's time say you could have some fear. Are you going to make the wrong decision or are you going to say something that's wrong or do something wrong in the project? But if you learn from those mistakes or at least go for it and show that you're wanting to be to make that change in one way or another, then I think that it's going to always help you further down the line. There's always people that have made the greatest changes in the world, the ones that have taken risks. So I think taking risks is the big one. I agree. I'm a huge risk taker. Not risk taker as in doing scary, silly stuff that's, you know, irrelevant, but taking risks as in I would go and, you know, take on an interview, even if I don't feel like I'm qualified enough. 
And a lot of the opportunities I've, I've had has been because I've been willing to take risks and step outside of my box. So I do agree with that. My last question for you is, what advice would you give to a young person listening to you right now who feels they're not good enough to enter the STEM industry? I would say to them that they should take a step back, consider their skill set and interests. Whatever sphere that you're really looking at, there will definitely be a role for you. It may not actually be the one that you're envisaging right now, but it will be one that definitely fits your skill sets. And once you engage and really talk to people and really see how they can help you, they will be able to give you the advice you need and you'll really be able to consider your options and see how you can progress in the STEM industry. Yeah, Isaac, do you know, I've really, 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 extremely, truly enjoyed this interview today. I feel so inspired. I'm definitely going to send this to my younger brother, who I don't I don't know if he wants to go into engineering, but I do feel the conversation we've had can inspire many people, young people who are looking at what they want to do next with their life after um, secondary school. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's been amazing. Uh, and to our listeners, thank you for listening. Please subscribe to our podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn at STEM Socials. And join us next time for another episode of Stepping Into STEM. I have been your host, Jessica Okoro. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.